Cool, thank you. Hey, uh, good evening, guys. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, again, my name is Tim Swanson. And uh, thanks again, Scott. I know you're not here, but I hope you feel better. It's apparently sick or something. Um, real quick, so the topic today is the continued existence of altcoins, app coins, and commodity coins. Uh, so I'm not sure if you guys know who I am. I'm going to be trying to be as, as diplomatic as I can. And my wife sells tomatoes if you want to throw stuff in there. <laughs> so uh, this picture here is actually, if you can't see it, it's a picture of different Linux distributions. I chose that because uh, that's kind of how I see the analogy of altcoins. I don't see it as a winner take all. Um, obviously, that's my own opinion. But uh, if you look historically with Linux distributions, in 1993, actually, uh, I believe it was July, Slackware came out, and a couple months later, Debian came out, and then after, after a while, you had a bunch of different distros. And not just because you had these distros doesn't mean one just, you know, took over. Uh, this competition bred better uh, distros later on. Um, so I call it a market of many flavors. Quick disclosure, so uh, along with what David said, I don't own any coins, so I'm allowed to say as many mean things as I want about coins, except for I do own one. Uh, let's talk Bitcoin coin because I just give that out like candy. Um, so yeah, this whole deck is not an endorsement of any particular coin, protocol, service. Um, be sure to consult with a professional uh, in terms of finance, uh, legal issues. People call me all sorts of names because I'm always talking about legal stuff. There's no reason for you to be thrown in jail. Uh, it's blue, blue skies, we like that, so don't go to jail. Um, so quick definitions, uh, altcoins up until recently, anything that was an altcoin was, or sorry, anything that was not Bitcoin was considered an altcoin. That's changed um, and we'll, we'll look at some of those later on. This is just a long, long definition. You can look at it, the deck will be up on SlideShare later on. Commodity coins, so uh, I don't think any of you guys, well, Brian, uh, so uh, basically, a commodity coin is linking an actual commodity, a physical commodity, with a coin, a hash on a blockchain somewhere. So originally, if you've heard of color coins, that's the, the idea. Commodity coins now, though, uh, typically use uh, a counterparty as the actual platform. App coins. I'm going to go through you know, more detail. Don't worry about it. Uh, app coins. So this is a pretty vague term. Um, you hear a lot of people throwing this term around now, and it's, it's not really well thought out, in my opinion. But uh, basically, these are tokens that somehow generate their value based on the underlying network. And the examples people use are loyalty cards, like gift cards, or uh, flying, uh, frequent flyer miles, subway tokens. So it gives you access to a particular uh, function. So uh, really what I wanted to talk about at the beginning is why are altcoins still being created? If you read Reddit and Twitter, there are people who swear that altcoins are going to be destroyed any day now. They'll just disappear. Well, this doesn't make sense for at least four or five different reasons. And they're all economic. They have nothing at all to do with people holding Bitcoin or not. Uh, the first is, is the most important, scarce labor. There's only a few people who can make blockchains. Um, I think there's probably a good handful here, actually I know, I, I recognize faces that you could actually build a blockchain. Uh, but because Bitcoin doesn't have a patron, there's no person actually pay you, uh, it's, it's double-sided, right? They can't fire you, but they can't actually pay you to actually improve on the code. So if you have the ability to do that, you have an incentive to actually make an alt so it could actually pay yourself. There's uh, solutions around that. The three that are, exist are Bitcoin Foundation. They actually pay some developers. A few private entities like BitPay, they pay private developers. And uh, Lighthouse is a project by Mike Hearn. You can check it out. It's uh, plugs in to the actual blockchain. It's open source. You could actually build the contracts on top of the network. Um, the other, other big reason is appreciating capital goods. Um, does anyone here actually mine before, mine anything? Okay, great. So then you're familiar with the difficulty rating. That's the, the SOB, right? So it basically, if you're not familiar with mining, anytime you add hash rate to a network, there's a corresponding difficulty rating change that basically equalizes it to where, in the long run, you know, there's an economic term I always write about, MV equals MC, marginal value equals marginal cost, but that's something else. Um, but the window of opportunity for profit in, in, in Bitcoin mining or uh, Litecoin mining or whatever is actually, for, particularly for, for Bitcoin mining, is, is about three months now. Actually, if you buy the best hardware today, it's actually today, you cannot plug it in and make money off. It's just the, the difficulty rating is so high and the cost of the hardware is too, well, unless you have subsidized electricity or free electricity or something like that, you just won't make any money. Um, Anyways, uh, so that's the second reason. So if you if you own this equipment, you have an incentive to actually build another chain so that way you can point it to that chain and make money off of that. So I, I would I suspect in a year or two, we'll find out that a lot of these altcoins are actually being made by miners. Um, core devs. So uh, I, I know people think that there's a lot of news. Oh, did I just break it? 
there's a lot of new features being added to Bitcoin Core. That's not true. Um, what you actually have is you had a slowdown because you don't want to break the code. So it's understandable to being very conservative. As a result, they've actually outsourced, effectively outsourced all the innovation to alt chains so that we could blow those up. And uh, although I, I think they use more diplomatic terms than that. Um, another, another reason, uh, fourth reason for why you have uh, altcoins is because it's open sourced. If you have an open source tool that's useful, it's going to signal to market players to actually fork it and try it out themselves. As long as you have universities and researchers and uh, big financial inst uh, institutions that have access to this open source technology. If, if, you, if you read uh, Michael Lewis's book, uh, Flash Boys, you know, Goldman and those guys, they basically just forked a bunch of code and, and used it in internally. Uh, fifth, did somebody say? A fifth reason, or maybe a sixth reason, I, I lost count. Uh, here, here in the valley, you have this, this uh, meme, this, this zeitgeist of build it, break it, learn, and repeat. And alt, alt chains and these, these other alt coins essentially allow you to do this recursively, uh, very quickly. Um, and you couldn't do that otherwise. It, you wouldn't want to blow up $10 billion or $5 billion worth of assets in the block, Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, these, these other alts are, are a way to do that. And you actually see this continuing today. Um, there's a, a guy, there's a presentation I recommend you guys watch, uh, Dave Hudson, he's the VP of Software Development at Pure Nova, and he's, I'm not sure if you guys know how the actual Bitcoin mining process works, it's a, it's a Poisson process, it's actually an in, in homogenous Poisson process, it's stochastic, meaning it's, it's a bell curve, so on average you'll have about a 10 minute time period for a block confirmation. Uh, on either end though, or actually on one end, because you can't actually do it on the other end, um, you'll have like one, one block every month where it actually takes you an hour. You can't build a real-time growth settlement device or a payment platform like Bitcoin and expect to have a block take a whole hour to go through. So he's figured out a way to actually do an incentive compatible way of, <coughs> of fork the code um, down to two minute block times. So if you do two minute block times, it's a little bit ameliorate some of these effects. Um, <coughs> anyways, so when did all this altcoin stuff start? Uh, I'm sure you've seen some of like, uh, Charlie Lee's presentations. I call it the guns of altcoin in August. If you're familiar with the European history, World War I, um, there was the Guns of August, that's when the major war European powers fought each other in 1914. And if you look at the date of, of when this kind of acceleration took place, it was in August of uh, 2011. So uh, real quick, I don't want to bore you with too many details. Namecoin, anyone heard of Namecoin? Yes, great. Nobody uses it, everyone talks about it at conferences though, right? In other words, it's gonna take over the identity and all that stuff. So it originally started as BitDNS. If you look at the uh, forums back in 2010, actually Satoshi made a couple comments, I believe. And uh, anyway, so if you look at the dates, these guys started doing a bunch of different forks. They tried to play around with the confirmation times. They played around with the mining, pre-mining. They messed around with the hash function. And uh, if, if you actually look, the, the one interesting one I actually think is interesting is that guy scaled. It had 15 second blocks and it basically proved or showed that it's really difficult to propagate blocks on a network without creating a lot of orphans. So there became this, this uh, kind of terminal limit in, in a decentralized manner. You can only propagate a block fast enough around the whole network globally. Um, so that's how they failed. Anyways, so Litecoin like, uh, like kind of learned from all that. Again, I'm not endorsing any of these coins. I don't own any of these coins. You know, have fun with them if you want. Again, uh, I recommend seeing Charlie Lee's Miami presentation. Another two people to look at are Art Fours and Solid, uh, Real Solid. They actually built some of these coins and then broke them. <sighs> okay. Am I talking fast enough for you guys? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, again, I work at a new exchange. We just closed our seed round. It's called Melodic. I don't own any of these coins, again. I'm not endorsing them. I'm just saying what we have. Blackcoin. The idea with Blackcoin, uh, they actually started as proof of work. They flipped it uh, after their FAs of, of work was done to proof of stake. Again, I'm not endorsing proof of stake. Proof of stake comes back, uh, if you look at the history, uh, 2011. Uh, I think it was August 2011, the guy named Quantum Mechanic, he was the guy who first authored it and then Manny Resenfeld came up with some other stuff. So far there's not been a proof of stake that's been successful as proof of stake. It's always centralized in some manner. I'm not saying that's going to happen with Blackcoin, in fact I don't know, maybe this is completely centralized. Uh, Purecoin is a good example of that. Purecoin has centralized checkoff points. Each block is signed by the development team, so it kind of defeats the whole purpose of decentralization. Uh, anyways, so they have 1% monetary inflation, if you will. Uh, Darkpoint. There's a new paper by Atlas Kristoff, it was this paper, uh, published a week or two ago. He analyzed this feature called DarkSend, and the idea is it's a decentralized coin join. Uh, coin join is a feature developed by Greg Maxwell that allows um, a type of mixing. Again, I'm not endorsing mixing. I don't, I don't endorse mixing. 
Um, and they use a hybrid of uh, proof of work. You see this X11. Um, 11, you, and you'll see this to uh, some of these new altcoins. What they actually did is they cobbled together a bunch of different hash functions. And it, so it's not just one or two, they've actually got 11. And you, you build on up. Um, Digital Tangible, uh, they're actually based in San Francisco. It's Tarek Lewis's team. They actually are the first, and I believe the only uh, legit commodity coin. They've linked an actual one tenth troy ounce of gold. Uh, they hold it in custodian. It's linked to a hash on the blockchain through Counterparty. And you can actually trade that on the chain. Um, let's talk Bitcoin coin. So, if you're not familiar, they have a podcast, there's a website, and you are given coins for providing content. The reason that this exists is because you have websites like uh, Huffington Post or Business Insider. They just scrape content, they don't pay you. I, I know, they scrape my content, they don't pay me. So, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not being mean to you guys. Um, so, basically they, they hand out, uh, Adam's team hands out coins as a proof of content or proof of activity. It's a way to try and incentivize people to actually continue doing that, whatever you're doing. Store J. So, uh, if you've ever used Tor and Freenet, which none of you guys have ever used, good, good, you're on camera, that's great. So, uh, one of the problems with Tor and, and Freenet is uh, you have a lot of free riders. Nobody actually wants to actually share their bandwidth. So, StoreJ, and there's a few other projects out there that are trying to incentivize people to actually monetize their bandwidth or disk space or however how you want to define it. Um, again, I'm not endorsing them, I actually think most app coins are half baked. But uh, they're trying, and uh, Sean Wilkinson, I believe, is the, the devil in that. Stellar, there's actually a guy from Stellar here, or was, unless he's already hates me and left. Um, they forked Ripple, about uh, an album announced about two months ago. They are actually using a different consensus, they will be using a different consensus algorithm, I believe, by the end of December. I think that's what David, uh, David's working on. 1% inflation also. Euro, Eurocoin. So. <laughs> It is supposedly pegged to one metric ton of urea. Does anyone know what urea is? Yeah, yeah it is. Well, not just fertilizer, it's manure. Pure byproduct. Yes, there we go. So uh, these guys caught our attention because they promised to actually do this deliverable. Hey, we have this blockchain that's going to keep track of this manure. We're like, oh, let's go for it. And we're actually going to delist them because they haven't delivered in three months. So. Um, <laughs> Oh, hey, I gotta be honest. I mean, like, just because they're on it doesn't mean they're gonna stay on it. Do you want one metric ton of urea delivered to you? Not to me. It's a, it's a, it's a farmer's. If you want it, I'm sure people after this will give me metric tons of urea just because they don't like what I have to say. Uh, Counterparty. So, uh, brief about Counterparty. They are one of these 2.0 platforms. They started in January. They did a thing called Proof of Burn, which basically you send a Bitcoin to a provably unspendable address, a terminal address in which there's no corresponding private key to actually control that. And they uh, they raised or they burned about 2,130 bitcoins, and in, in the process, uh, I'll give you some other stats in a little bit. Um, they uh, you can actually if you have these XCP, that's their native token, you can actually issue assets, and that's where a lot of these 2.0 uh, programs are using. Monero. Uh, so there was this two years ago, CryptoNote came out, nobody heard of it. They launched in stealth, and since then you've had several different forks of CryptoNote, which was written on written from the ground up. It's uh, supposedly more privacy intensive and stuff like that. Although recently, I think um, Peter Todd's been criticizing it on Twitter, and he's talked about stuff problems. But the, the notable feature here is ring signatures. Basically, you when you do process a transaction, you actually send it in a group. So it's you know the whole group can be accused of sending it. You have to identify each people in order to, to, to you have to dox each person in order to find out who actually sent that. Okay, so that was a little bit melodic. Why did we create melodic? Um, so uh, this is it gets me in a lot of trouble, actually. Um, consumer behavior on the blockchain. So we have this beautiful thing, this public ledger that no one actually looks at. Everyone talks about it, but no one actually looks at the data. And this is a snapshot of actually what the activity is on the blockchain. This was created uh, two months ago by John Radcliffe. And what he did is he showed in this visual aid, it's really hard to see, when the last time a Bitcoin was moved, essentially. And uh, it goes all the way from four to five, four to six years, it starts from one day. So. Um, basically, the bulk of Bitcoins just don't move, and they haven't moved in more than six months. There's a lot of different reasons, a lot of different theories why people think that it hasn't moved. But you have a, a basically liquidity period of about 10% altogether. So, uh, and that's been about the case uh, not the last nine months. You can yell at me, that's okay, just, that's what the evidence shows so far on-chain. Um, so this could mean several different things in, in general. Um, well, we know, what, we know at least through self-reporting from guys like BitPay that there's about two to four million dollars worth of uh, actual commerce each day. Uh, we also know that uh, UTXO holders, so actual Bitcoin holders, they like to store coins forever. 
like bury it in the ground. Um, the remaining liquidity, and again, unless you do a full traffic analysis, it's impossible to know exactly what's going on. It could be mining rewards, it could be gambling, it could be mixing. You basically send to a burner wallet. A burner wallet is like sending to coins to blockchain.info using their shares, shares and feature, and then you, you know getting rid of that wallet. Um, illicit activities, um, and then uh, the other part would be trading on exchanges. Again, unless you have the ability to actually analyze the entire pattern of the network, you won't know exactly what percentage. So, now that we know what's going on in the network, or at least have an idea of the activity, how do you build a business around that activity? Now, you could do something uh, and screw up like with the platform trap. The platform trap is this idea that, hey, you build this technology and people will come. That's the Kevin, Kevin Costner syndrome, right? You hope to come. Um, it's usually a bad idea. You want to build technology or build a service that people actually will use. So, uh, at least if you want to do a return on investment. If you guys just want to do charitable activities, that's okay. So, uh, current transactions per minute. Um, uh, a lot of uh, talk has been about current uh, transactions per second. Theoretically, Bitcoin could do about seven transactions per second. Doge can do 10 times that. Uh, Litecoin can do four times that. But in practice, what you actually have is uh, Bitcoin and Dogecoin are actually roughly the same, and Litecoin's down there at two to three. And the source there is uh, chain.so. Uh, so, and we know that the transactions per minute, not all that's uh, the same. Um, if you look at that last slide, we don't know exactly what that is. For example, Forex. Every day you have processors, uh, payment processors like BitPay that sell all their Bitcoins in bulk in a couple different transactions. Does that count as actual commerce between uh, when you sell houses and cars and so on? Uh, that's a debate for another slide or another deck. Um, so some questions with this, this data. Uh, why is Litecoin stagnated? Uh, basically, they have different community dynamics. If anyone does Litecoin stuff, they don't dress up like dogs and stuff like that, right? There's no mascot. Um, and they also face uphill institutional inertia. Basically, any VC-funded com company in the space, they're focused on Bitcoin for one reason or another. Maybe they're worried about branding or perception, they don't want to do some confusion or something like that. There's no technical reason they can't support the uh, alts, but they just support Bitcoin itself. Um, so that's why Lite Litecoin may have stagnated. Uh, why has uh, Dogecoin succeeded this far? Maybe it'll still collapse, I don't know. Um, and what, if, if you look at cryptocurrencies, each cryptocurrency is a startup. You need to worry about traction channels. How do you get that next user, right? And what's happened with, uh, with, with Dogecoin is they kind of did some guerrilla marketing. Yeah, this is the older deck, sorry. Uh, so yeah, the, this is uh, the guerrilla marketing. Basically, they, they figured out different ways to get their brand in front of new faces, and they did that through NASCAR driving, and they did that with uh, Jamaican bobsled stuff. Um, whereas uh, Bitcoin, basically, they saturated their, their traction channels. They focused on Reddit, Twitter, and then yelling at you if you don't use either one. So, uh, it's true. So, uh, let's move on. Dogecoin and Doge Party tra transactions. So, I already mentioned uh, Counterparty, they burned 2,130 Bitcoins. Um, Doge Party, uh, anyone here do anything with Doge Party? I'll look at this guy right here. Yeah. So, uh, Doge Party is a fork of Counterparty on top of the Dogecoin network. Yeah, uh, so it's kind of memetic, right? And so what they, what they actually did during a one month period of time, or 28, period, period, uh, 28 days, they burned 1.85 billion Dogecoins, which is equivalent to about 2.01% of their money supply. Um, and that sounds like a lot. Um, in fact, when I, when I first heard that that's the number that they burned, I was like, oh, that graph, when you actually look at it, it's just gonna be this linear line. In fact, it isn't. So it's really hard to see this. This is uh, the Dogecoin transaction uh, volume chart. Has anyone actually ever seen this before? No, you guys all just go to blockchain and you look at the Bitcoin one, you're like, oh yeah, it hit 80,000, right? So, uh, the, the Dogecoin one is pretty jagged, and this actually, I think, shows that it's really difficult to do forensics when you're actually saying, oh, how much of this transactional volume has to deal with actual commerce versus gambling versus mixing and so on. So, this is the period, time period in which the burn took place. It's not some even linear line, it's just all over the place. Um, and so, I know some people say, oh, it's tipping. Uh, almost all of Dogecoin transactions, are, almost all those Dogecoin tips are actually done centralized off-chain. It doesn't actually ever touch the chain. Um, Litecoin versus Dogecoin hash rate. Um, so, does anyone actually pay attention to hash rate besides Bitcoin's hash rate? Okay, some random guy. All right. So, basically, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk later. You won't be random anymore. So, uh, if, you, if you look at Dogecoin, this, this little, little blip down here, that's actually a 50% dive. That was actually, July 15th is when they had a block reward halving. If you're not familiar with block reward halving, that's like 
That's my thing. I talk about chapter three all the time. So basically, it's the most important thing in any altcoin at all. As soon as you have a block reward having, you lose 50% of your labor force. And so what happened is the Bitcoin, as the Dogecoin developers were like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we're gonna end up getting so low to where some of these script miners in, in China will hit us with the 51% because they don't like us. And uh, what they ended up doing, their solution to this, is they implemented something called Oxpo, uh, Auxiliary Proof of Work, which is a nice name of saying merge mining. Does anyone know what merge mining is? All right, well, uh, I don't have time to talk about it. Google it, it's what Namecoin uses to attach itself to the Bitcoin network. Anyways, uh, if you can't see it from over there, uh, you had this dramatic increase um, for, from when they implemented it uh, last week. Actually, it was September 11th. And um, so they're, they're secure for now, it saved them a bit. I know that doesn't sound really sexy, but it was, you end up losing all your assets or you have this trust issue if you get hit by one of these attacks. Um, okay, so the next two things um, I'm just going to show you here. This is a Bitcoin Litecoin transaction fee uh, list. This is actually our uh, charter. You actually see how much people pay miners to actually process their transactions. And uh, it's relatively flat, which means people don't like to pay fees, or they don't have to, they just free right off of the subsidy. In Dogecoin, it's a little bit uh, similar. Uh, you do have some of these outliers, and again, I'm not sure what these outliers are, why it spikes like that, but it's, it's actually significant. It's a 50% gain. Um, it could be because they've had a price increase and because of ASICs that came online uh, through OxPOW. That might be one of the reasons. We won't know for probably months. So, uh, the reason this is important uh, is because uh, of this thing called Script Alliance. I, I sent this deck out to uh, Jackson Palmer to get his ideas. Jackson Palmer created Doge. And uh, his, his, uh, his name for this whole system now is when, when anyone's attaching themselves to Litecoin's uh, network, uh, he's calling it an alliance. And this is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, uh, it secures them, uh, but Litecoin has essentially become the profitability layer that drives the security of Dogecoin's network. But it might not be sustainable. Um, again, if you're building an altcoin, if any of you are building altcoins or appcoins, it's important to make sure you get your incentives correct. Otherwise, for example, if the value of Litecoin falls, then the overall hash rate will decline and you're back to square one with being uh, vulnerable to attacks. Same thing happens in next year at quarter three, uh, Litecoin will have a block reward having, and again, they could lose 50% of their, their uh, fleet, their labor force. Other observations, so uh, basically, uh, ooh, uh, I wrote an article about three, four months ago on disproportional rewards. Did anyone read that one? No? Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so you've heard of these meta coins, these altcoins, or these uh, like counterparty, met, uh, master coin, and color coin, right? They create these assets on top, but they don't actually incent that they, even though they might add some more value to the network, they don't actually create an incentive to burn that exact amount of capital. So let's say you put a hundred thousand dollar house on a meta coin. On the, net, on the network, no miner is incentivized to burn any more capital to actually protect that. That becomes uh, a bigger issue later down the road if you have, for example, bonds being uh, hung, hanging out on the network. If you have $20 billion worth of bonds and your network is only burning $10 billion worth of capital, there's an economic incentive to actually uh, do a 51% on whatever those bonds are if it's a color. Uh, again, it's theoretical, hasn't been done yet. Um, and same thing will happen with Do could happen with Doge Party if since they fork Counterparty, same idea. Um, another thing that uh, we've learned with Litecoin and Dogecoin, um, you cannot multiply whatever their volume is by USD. You see this often in, in articles in Bitcoin media. Basically, they say, "Oh, this amount of volume is taking place with Bitcoin." We, it's untrue. You can't do that because you don't know if, if that's actual commerce, if it's mining rewards, if it's gambling. It's just Bob sending coins back and forth. You can't do that with altcoins either. Uh, very few people pay TX fees on any chain. Uh, I know this doesn't sound like a big deal today, but it's a huge deal later on when you have block reward having fees will have to go up to incentive miner, incentivize miners to actually uh, hash. Um, and most, if not all, tipping is on off to you. So, uh, more about 2.0 stuff. Again, I'm not endorsing any of these. These are just examples. Um, NXT is written from the ground up in Java. It uh, actually might have some problems that Jeff Garzik's been talking about it a lot in the last week or two on, on Twitter. If you don't know Jeff Garzik, he works at BitPay, he's at Core Dev. Uh, Stellar and Ripple, um, kind of similar today. Uh, no offense to anyone who works there. Uh, Mastercoin, uh, they launched a year ago. They had their crowdfunding or their Exodus sale, whatever, uh, August last year. BitShares, uh, they're using something called uh, uh, Delegated Proof of Stake. Basically, they have uh, successful proof of stake, but it's based on quasi-trust. 
Um, open transactions, you know, they're always talking, but they don't really release much. I'm sure they're going to send me some hate mail for that. Uh, Coinify, uh, they're based here. It's Tom Ding's operation, and uh, they're releasing decentralized applications and decentralized corporations through the counterparty system. And Color Coins, there's two teams, Coin Prism and Chrome Away. I believe they're both basically out of Israel. And if you want to look up Color Coins, I think, I think many Rosenfeld actually wrote a paper on that a couple years ago. All right, so this is probably what a lot of you guys want to see. Here's the future, and who knows how many of these will survive. You know, you've got to be skeptical. Uh, Ethereum, you know, they've received a lot of free PR, so I'm not going to give them any more. Uh, Tezos, uh, they are a project out in, it's by Ellen Goodman. They are, that's a, that's a pseudonym, that's actually not his name. Uh, they're using proof of stake. The paper's pretty cool. He's actually funding it himself. Uh, that's not his real name, by the way. Um, Tendermint, it's based in San Francisco. Jay Kwan is one developing. It's also proof of stake. It actually, who wants to call it proof of bond? We can talk about that later. Pebble, uh, based in Palo Alto. Dominic Williams is leading that. It's a proof of process. He's, he's figured out a different consensus method uh, to, to, for this entire uh, Byzantine issue. Um, Nimblecoin, if you know Sergio Lerner. Anyone know Sergio Lerner? Oh, that's disappointing. Sergio Lerner is the guy who did the security analysis and figured out that Satoshi might have a million coins. So he's the guy who did the forensics on that. He's got his own coin. Uh, he's going to do merge mining into Bitcoin itself. And it has all the cool features like smart contracts. Uh, Doge Ethereum is a fork of Ethereum. Do you believe that? Ethereum hasn't even released yet. Somebody's actually forked it. And uh, the team is led by uh, Preston Byrne in London. It's called Eros. Factum, formerly Notary Chains. This is Paul Snow's uh, project. So this is interesting. Basically, um, in 2010, 2011, 2012, you had people being foreclosed on because banks had been acquired and merged and they didn't keep track of the people's uh, property correctly. You've seen this in the news. Yeah, maybe some of you had that happen. Uh, so uh, he, his solution to this is basically hash all these uh, property records onto a, a blockchain of some kind. So you could do proof of providence and this won't happen again, in theory. He uses the MasterCoin uh, protocol for that. SkewChain, uh, another cool, innovative, uh, actual blockchain, blockchain technology. They're based in Palo Alto, it's Zeki Menyan, it's Sri. They, uh, they're using delegated proof of stake. And what they want to actually do is they want to integrate a blockchain into a supply chain. So basically take someone like Pfizer, you say, hey, here's a blockchain, here's some coins. They're not actually, there's no currency value to it. It's just so that way you can track supplies. And as, they, uh, as the supplies go down the supply chain through the vendors, all the way down to the end user, the end user could actually look through the provenance to see where this actual package came from and if it was violated. If it was violated, obviously you can't stop somebody from breaking into like a purse or that guy's iPad or something like that as he walks away. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, they're, I think, doing a seed right now. Hyperledger, uh, uh, disclosure. I actually am an advisor on the Hyperledger team. Just full disclosure. Uh, they are based in China. Um, they're using something called uh, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance. And they are, uh, there's no tokens involved. That's why I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, Filecoin, they're a YC company, uh, y, y Combinator uh, startup. And uh, if you're familiar with Permacoin, a similar idea. Uh, basically, they want to incentivize the decentralization of storage somehow. Uh, Tree Chains is a project from Peter Todd, who's a core dev. And they're using a test bed uh, on Viacoin. Basically, he wants to decentralize the mining process. Uh, I know some people don't think that mining is centralized. It is, and you're wrong. Um, Sidechains. So, uh, Sidechains is it's about a year old, basically. Sidechains uh, originally started, I think Alex Murzaki came up with the first idea, but it's being implemented and popularized by a two-way pay system through a company called Blockstream, which is run by Austin Hill and Adam Back. They're actually going to have some news in about two weeks, I believe. Uh, Peter Nova, they're down in San Jose. They are a full vertical stack company. They actually designed the mining equipment. They have a cloud hashing facility, and now they built a software stack on top. So they want to do this entire they have a name for it, and I'm sure you'll see some more presentations. It's interesting. Um, and there's also several startup, uh, self startups. Um, I guess it's not too stealthy if I actually put one of the names. VPAL, it's out of China. Uh, it's like a ripple fork. Okay, so now that I've mentioned all these alts, that you guys are obviously going to go spend your entire, you're going to mortgage your home and, and buy some. So, uh, what are some of the, ha the hurdles? Uh, you've you got obvious scams and pump and dumps. That's just a given. In fact, uh, <laughs> One of my jobs is, uh, I have to, on Skype, I talk every day to people trying to get us to list coins, and they never show me their face and never say, you know, they don't talk, so, you know, what are they trying to hide? Well, you know, Satoshi didn't do that either, so, I mean, maybe he, I, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, 
Another issue is a dev team uh, lacks the skills to actually make this code. So you've seen promises, all sorts of empty promises at conferences you know, every week basically at this point this year uh, with very little code being shipped. Um, it's easy to make promises. Uh, also, the economics of Aquacoins may not be well thought out. Um, again, I'm not targeting this towards anyone in particular. But if you have an uh, inelastic money supply, and uh, the only way to reflect uh, changes in demand of that, for example, an increase in demand of that, is you're going to reflect that through prices, increase in prices. If you have an increase in price, then it's, you're going to end up having an incentive to actually hoard that. If you hoard or hold that, if you hold that, then it actually diminishes the liquidity in the system and actually makes the network maybe floppy. Okay, so uh, different uh, proof of work hash functions. Um, so you've all heard of uh, SHA-256D, that's what's used in Bitcoin. You've heard of Script, which is used in Litecoin, and a few of these others, like Dogecoin. These are some other ones. Uh, you've heard, I'm not sure if you've seen X11, X13, X14, that's the same thing. They just cobble together a bunch of different hash functions. The idea is, is once one becomes profitable enough to scale through some mechanism like ASICs, um, they turn on another one. And the idea is, is to help promote decentralization. Uh, so if you're not familiar with how mining works, once you can profitably scale through NRE, so non-recoverable uh, engineering, once you can throw $500,000 at something, make an ASIC out of it, then you can you know, have an enormous amount of hash rate uh, jump um, and leads towards centralization of mining. List of coins hit with 51% tech. There's a ton, I'm not gonna go through them. Here's the some that are notable. Uh, legal uncertainty, yeah, so uh, don't get arrested, please. Um, if, you, if you're involved with something that's saying crypto securities or crypto equities, uh, definitely talk to a lawyer and don't say that stuff on TV in America. Or you can if you want, you can try. Um, digital currency crowd sales, uh, pretty cool, innovative, also could be a problem because it passes a Howey test. Howey test is an SEC case, Google it. Uh, basically if you are uh, selling something that accounts to being or is essentially a security, you might have to have filed an IPO prospectus with the SEC. If you didn't, then you could be sued and all sorts of mean things happen to you. Um, indemnification. Uh, most developers don't have the funds to indemnify users, so if you have a chain and you're promising particular performance on the chain, for example, equity or dividends or something uh, attached to it and you get sued or they get sued, how do you actually indemnify them? Most people not. UPL, unlicensed practice of law. Uh, any lawyers here? Okay, great. So uh, he's got a monopoly on law in the jurisdiction of California. Uh, basically, each, each jurisdiction globally, I'm not actually, each country is different, but they have these things called bar associations. Bar associations like to protect their own, and they do this by uh, suing people who, don't, who are practicing without a license. And you see these people in conferences saying, we're going to replace lawyers, we're going to replace law, we're going to replace governments and stuff like that. You can say that all you want, but you, know, you might actually face the wrath of a, a bar association or two in the process. Um, money transmitter license. So, again, this is why it's really important to actually talk to a lawyer. Because if you are issuing coins, even if you're giving them away, you might be considered a money transmitter. Um, so on the one side, you could actually apply for a FinCEN, you could apply to FinCEN for a money transmitter license. Supposedly it's pretty easy, I haven't done it myself. Um, but the downside is once you get it, you probably will lose your banking relationship because they don't want to have to deal with people who do money transmission. So, talk to lawyers, please. I could recommend some after this if you want. Uh, Steve Jane. So, um, this is where I get the tomatoes thrown at me because I, I actually say that there's different ways of coming up with distributed consensus. In fact, there's an entire award, award annually called the Distra Prize, and it's been going on for about 15 years. So, uh, proof of work, hash-based proof of work, is not the only way to do consensus. And you can yell at me later if you want. Uh, and we've seen this uh, kind of evolution and innovation taking place in alts for that. But as a result, you have this kind of fragmentation taking place in code base. I know people say, oh, fragmentation is bad, it's horrible. Uh, well, we have fragmentation in the automobile industry, auto industry, computer industry. You have uh, in, a fragmentation in any competitive market, any open market. So it's kind of, it makes sense that there'll be fragmentation here too. Uh, what that just means is you have to be specialized in particular code bases. Um, another lesson is you need to incentivize uh, mining, otherwise it becomes self-terminating. Uh, Nicholas Corta calls it self-destructive. And uh, maybe there will be some solutions through sidechains and tree chains, so it might not be all that bad. Uh, last few questions before we go on to the death of... Diff Oops. That was good timing. One second. This computer's just been great tonight. The death. Is that something I pick up? The death. All right, all right. So there's this phrase called the rising tide lifts all boats, and you've seen this happen. If, you, if you're on any Bitcoin mailing list or you, you, you 
read Reddit or anything like that, people are like, oh, the reason it, it increased, these alts increase in prices is because Bitcoin also increased in price. Maybe it is. Maybe it's an actual substitute good. Google that if you're not familiar. It's, a, it's a, an economics term. If you actually think that the, if, if Bitcoin and all these other chains are similar, we would call that a substitute good. Um, obviously, that's a presentation for some, some other time. Uh, but the idea is this. If, if you have a chain that uh, is inelastic, and again, to reflect the to reflect the demand of it, you end up having a price increase, and therefore people seeing this and see other chains are like, oh, well, there's no reason that this should be going up, these other ones shouldn't, so I'm going to invest in these other chains. That's an that could be a uh, explanation for why these coins go up. How to define success with all coins? Um, you see this often on on Twitter, also people saying, oh, this coin failed in one day or one month. Dude, you've given Bitcoin five and a half years. I think it's only fair that you give all coins five and a half years to try and that out too. Um, at least that's my own, my own view, the grace period equal. Uh, double standard also, this is very common now on Reddit, you see people saying, oh, we don't know who the developer is. Yeah, I, I see that face to face, or I guess not face to face, because they won't show me their face on Skype. Uh, but you know, it's okay for Satoshi to apparently do that. Does anyone actually know who Satoshi is in here? Yeah, okay. Well, hey, if you, if you did, you should tell us who it is, because you know, that would only be fair in this, in this paradigm, right? You have to know who these developers are. There's a couple uh, initiatives, uh, one's called Proof of Developer, from Crypto Asian, and he tries to do that, where he actually like gives a star rating on whether or not he's could verified email and like verified uh, different things, including face. Satoshi wouldn't pass that test. Um, same thing with anonymous miners. The whole purpose of the decentralized network was so that way people could, you know, independently create these tokens. And if we had to dox everybody, like who are these different pools? That defeats the whole purpose of having a decentralized network. Um, okay, so here's the part where you guys get to all laugh at all coins. So uh, Ray Dillinger's death coin list. So does anyone know who Ray Dillinger is? Is Ray Dillinger here? It's okay if you're Ray Dillinger. It's okay. Uh, so if you look at the original Mesdowd, uh, uh, Mesdowd uh, cryptograph cryptography list in 2008 when Satoshi released a paper in October, he uh, one of the first persons to actually respond was a guy named Ray Dillinger. And he had some comments. And then he stuck with the community. He posted on Bitcoin Talk. And actually, he's in the Bay Area. I'm, I'm not going to dox him. So, anyways, he uh, he he's got this list of uh, attributes for what could make an altcoin survive or die, and so on. So, the first one is if the dev is anonymous, it has a three times uh, three times you're three times more likely to fail. So, if you're trying to make some chains, maybe you shouldn't be anonymous just statistically. Um, other thing is uh, with block rewards. You don't worry about this again. This will be on uh, online. Uh, basically, if if your coin does not double in value by the time you have a block reward having, you might have miners leave. And he actually thinks that you know maybe in the long run, uh, Bitcoin might have that problem. We'll find out it's an empirical thing. You can't know this a priori. Uh, number three, so IPOs. Number one, please do not call things IPOs unless you want to be a visit from a lawyer. Um, unless you actually are doing an IPO, that'd be cool. Um, so basically, if these coins are issuing an IPO and you're trying to buy them with money, um, you need to, you know, be cautious because maybe they are just going to take that money and run like they've done historically. Uh, being able to fix problems. Does anyone actually know how to fix a blockchain? Yeah, we have like three people in here and they all probably are much smarter than everybody else. Anyways, so yeah, it takes a certain you know brain to actually fix uh, blockchains um, and most uh, uh, altcoin projects don't have that even though they might promise some stuff. Um, there's a point. So uh, is, as many complaints as I might have towards uh, you know, Bitcoin or however you want to uh, interpret my, my, my views on it, um, it still might be just be good enough. So what's the point of making the alt unless it does something that the Bitcoin cannot do or does not do today? Um, that's one of his things he, he expects. Um, number six, uh, philanthropy. You see all these social coins coming out. Um, again, not against social ICDs and stuff like that. That's great in theory. But in practice, uh, it comes down to incentives. So if you, if you are uh, making a, a new coin or new chain, make sure your incentives are lined up. Otherwise, you could end up being, you know, smashed by some mining pools or something like that. Um, if there's a pre-mine, be sure that the devs are absolutely honest about that. So, anyone know what a pre-mine is? All right. So, if you don't know what a pre-mine is, real quick, proof of work systems have to be mined out. That's the way they're set up. And if you have a proof of work system and you you take some of those initial coins and you give them to yourself without mining them or without allowing other people to mine, we call that a pre-mine. It's a little bit different than a pre-allocation like uh, Ripple or Stellar. Those aren't pre-mines because there's no mining ever done, period. Um, anyway, so if you have a pre-mine, you want to know where those coins actually go. Um, eight, uh, is there a difference between the block reward structure? So um, this is effectively skimming. Basically, if, if you tell people, hey, the block reward is going to be 
you know, 100 coins per minute and it turns out to be 90, maybe somebody's skimming somewhere through the program and you need to go audit that code. Uh, okay, so just a couple more slides. I know a couple of you guys have already yawning. Um, it wouldn't make much sense if the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ uh, just listed a couple of, or just one security, Microsoft, and it wouldn't make sense if just the brokers just traded one stock, period. Uh, in fact, uh, just a quick FYI, uh, the way we use the term exchange in Bitcoin is incorrect. In the real world, uh, exchanges and brokers have this, you know, there's this clear difference between the two. Um, and in Bitcoin, we've actually merged those two together. So that's why you have all this conflict of interest taking place. Um, so uh, looking at all the Cambrian explosion of altcoins and altcoins and stuff like that, uh, this is clearly shows that people want to have choices. Markets want to have choice, innovators want to have choice, um, and they want to poke and probe uh, to find out what the weakness is or what the strengths of these are. Last slide. So again, I work in exchange. What does the exchange space look like? There's a website called Venture Scanner. Uh, Venture Scanner basically divides all these different startup spaces into different verticals. In the Bitcoin space, they have 12 verticals. And there's 22 funded exchanges in that, which have raised 113 million. And if you look at the volume on these exchanges, they range from 40 to 100 million dollars a day. That doesn't include OTC stuff. What I mean by OTC is anything that's not public on like Bitstamp or BTCE. You have basically dark inventory. Basically any, ex any big provider like Coinbase or Circle, um, they have uh, liquidity providers through some guys like Buttercoin or Quorum and uh, even BitPay. Like basically, none of these coins are actually hitting the open market. They're hitting uh, these, these dark uh, liquidity providers. Uh, so we don't know how much that is. I've heard numbers that actually are, are larger than the public, so keep that in mind. Uh, maybe the market is larger, but it's Forex essentially. Um, right now you have two general types of exchanges, Bitcoin to fiat exchanges, which you guys have all probably used. Don't admit it, right? Um, and then everything under the sun, altcoin exchanges like Beater and Cripsy and, and Pal and all those guys. So uh, what we're trying to do at Melodic, we're trying to do a lot more due diligence. So that's why I know all this stuff about coins, because I actually try to find out who they are and what they do. And uh, we're working on price discovery. Uh, we're trying to provide a platform for price discovery for unique coins. That's it. All right, any questions or tomatoes? Could you do it again, a little slower? A little slower? <laughs> well, I'll put it on YouTube, it's okay. Anything else? Have you heard any word of uh, the integration of a pseudonymous credit rating? And what, opinion, what opinions do you have on AE coin? Okay, uh, so a credit rating system is this kind of holy grail. In order to do that, you need to have some kind of identity. So somebody would need to actually have to like have a perm address somewhere, like a permanent link address, right? Uh, so there's different ways to public. But you'll end up doxing that person at some point, right? So that's the trouble. Uh, I'd actually recommend if anyone's actually looking at how to do uh, identity or uh, this escrow idea, or uh, we were just talking about. I would look at some of the works of Nick Sabo. Uh, he's written about about all this stuff for the last 20 years. Anybody else? Oh, AE coin. I'm not familiar with AE coin. Sorry. No. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for anyone trying to build a blockchain-based political system? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So it's it's hard. Uh, there's a there's a group called Startup Cities uh, Startup Cities Institute. Just talked to the guy who founded it uh, today. Actually, his name is uh, Zachary Caseras. He went to NYU. He's down in Guatemala. And uh, he has this thing called Immunibit. Immunibit was this idea of using a blockchain for NGOs and for emerging markets. He's found out it's pretty hard to try and integrate this stuff into emerging markets uh, because uh, as cool as the blockchain sounds, it's more of a hammer and it's being shoehorned into things it's not particularly good at. You could have a centralized solution that's just as good, um, it costs less. Um, and there's another project called BitNation. I'm not endorsed. By the way, I don't endorse any of these things besides Melodic. So, any, any other questions? Yeah, you started speaking about the difference of the Bitcoin exchange and what it is in Bitcoin space and like in the traditional finance. So this sound is very interesting. Can you continue on this? Like why why we have all these troubles? You, you mentioned this is because we have different terms on the... Yeah, sure. Well, okay. fine. Yeah, uh, so this is a great question. Uh, does anyone here trust exchanges? So one... I love Coinbase. Uh, but Coinbase is, a, Coinbase is a dark pool. You have no idea if they're front running you or anything. You can quote me on that one. Uh, so yeah, uh, you, you have these problems. If you, I recommend everyone read Michael Lewis's book called Flash Boys. And so uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, you basically had the last 
decade, all these different HFT companies go out and, and purposely build uh, exchanges that are longer, farther away from financial centers on purpose, simply because it creates delays in latency, or it creates latency in the signals that are propagated to bring back to the, the, the orders to the actual stock market. And they confront money by doing that. Um, well, I just did that in like 200 words. Sorry, Michael, no one's gonna buy your book now. Um, so with, with Bitcoin exchanges, uh, the biggest problem is you have a conflict of interest. Nobody's really transparent. Now, there's, there's some efforts to do transparency. Jonathan Levine at Coinometrics has this survey he's been pushing out um, at coinometrics.com. I think the survey's still up. And there's been a couple exchanges that have tried to push for transparency, saying if they have any bots running. Some of these, like BTCE sometimes has a bot running. Um, I'm not gonna, uh, I, I don't know what to say about uh, last fall. Uh, some of the Chinese exchanges, you basically had enormous volumes that were unclear if it was generated how. Like, there's just no, no known uh, explanation for that happened. It could be a legitimate trade. Again, I have nothing against OKCoin or Colby or anything like that. But uh, you have a clear conflict of interest without having a, a separation of powers between the exchange and brokerage. Uh, I'm not sure what we'll do with Melodic ourselves. I mean, we need lots of volume before we can even front run you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what's your take on uh, margin accounts and exchanges and uh, the, uh, the ability to short and to make derivatives of, of, the, um, of, of actual cryptocurrencies? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think that's going to come with the territory, any financial innovation like that. I'm not anti-shorting. Uh, I know people like, Tim, you must be shorting Bitcoin all the time. There's really no good counterparty to short it out. You have Bitfinex and they have like $30 million worth of you know, ability to do that. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily trust them and I'm not sure if it's worth... Uh, so how do you fund it? How do you fund it? How do you fund a short? Because you have to borrow. So normally, I can introduce you to some people. I know a hedge fund is, does that. Well, no, I mean you. I mean you can. So normally, to to not make it short a stock, right? Sure. You're supposed to theoretically borrow the stock. Borrow it first, yeah. So you have to, so you have to find a. So people talk to General Tim Draper and say, "Hey, I'm going to borrow this from you," uh -huh. and it's short. Uh, so actually, there's a guy from Hedgy here. Right, right there, and you can talk to him if you guys, or two guys, uh, they're through Boost VC. They're actually trying to do pair up longs and shorts. So uh, it's an immature market, yeah, for sure. And I, I, I think that as the years go by, that will become uh, more professionalized. I'm not sure, depending on the New York regulations, that might be not legal outside of certain jurisdictions. It's going to be jurisdictional. Like, like maybe Singapore will be the place people go to do that all. Maybe Hong Kong. Um, so I'm not sure about here in California. You need to talk to a lawyer about that one. Any other questions? This open question, since you're so close to it, um, Alibaba and Bitcoin, and what movement you've seen at the, the adoption of that, or all, all coins? Okay, has anyone actually participated in a real stock IPO? Participated. All right, so this is, this is good. Uh, you understand, uh, if you, for those who haven't, you have underwriters of an IPO. And in this case, there was like 21 underwriters that had access to the stock and put up the, the price. In order to get an allocation as a member of the public, you had to punch everybody, basically. There was really, I know a couple people that have a lot of money that understand this IPO that's been around, that's been known for months at a time. So I think it's completely silly, or I'm not targeting you, but I think it's a silly proposition to suggest that the Alibaba IPO is what brought the Bitcoin price down. Because that would mean that somebody like Tim Draper with a ton of coins was exiting his positions the very same day that the IPO was happening and he was converting it to dollars somehow to his uh, broker or something. It's just logistically would not happen. Uh, they, everyone's known this IPO is going to happen for weeks. It's just like, oh, IPO today, that wasn't a surprise. Anybody else? What are you most excited about? What are the limitations now? I feel like just all again, as you said, a lot of false promises. What is it going to take? Okay, yeah, my personal opinion, it's not a lot of opinion, is I think almost all these platforms will probably fail. Not because I'm trying to be mean, but just statistically, if you look at them as startups, most startups fail, uh, like 70%. In this space, it's even higher. Uh, and I'm not trying to be mean, again, but uh, in terms of actually that, that slide I showed with all the different 2.0 platforms, the one that's farthest ahead that's actually pushed the most production code uh, is, is Ripple and, and Counterparty. They've been shipping nonstop, uh, and these other ones, talk a lot, basically. I'm not saying that they won't we won't perform, but uh, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Well, what are the limitations? Why haven't they taken off? Yeah, well, what's, what are the use cases? Again, I, I, I'll be honest, like the biggest disappointment for me after writing the 
chain of numbers uh, this spring was I was expecting somebody to tell me an actual uh, use case that was a hair on fire idea. Like everyone's always talking about smart contracts, but no one actually says, you know, where is this killer use case? I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I actually think it's all going to be very mundane stuff, like letters of credit or uh, notary services. And nobody, that's not sexy. That doesn't get conference attention. You know, so, you know, the people are actually trying to do this pragmatic stuff, you don't see much. And um, I'm not sure if counterparty is going to be a solution. They're actually going to have an announcement in a couple weeks. But it's not related to, you know, this mundane stuff. It's going to be related to, I won't tell you. It's a secret. <laughs> you can talk to me afterwards, okay? Yeah, you started talking about the, the user scenarios and so on. I was just wondering, maybe you see already, the, like, some kind of a demand that you, like, Predict that it's going to be really something in the future, like a trend, because so far all that you you just talked about, it's it's great, but we all see like the attempts to create the demands. Like at least, at least it's what I see from it. What's your opinion? It's yeah, it's hard to create demand, right? It's exactly. uh, you need to create you need to, you need to find traction channels, mm -hmm. right? And that's why you see people say, oh, Bitcoin doesn't have a PR problem. It does have a PR problem if you want to get up to new people. So. And, it's my own opinion. Uh, basically, yeah, if you want to get some new people on board and you, you, to actually buy these coins or pr pr use these services, you need to find people who actually solves an actual pain problem for. And most of these services really don't right yet. You mentioned, uh, I think you said you're an advisor for companies doing the tokenless, so, and you mentioned that's interesting. So, what are I mean, tokens versus tokenless? Like, what are the what are the drawbacks? Sure, yeah, okay, so it's Hyperledger, it's the name of the company, hyperledger.com, and we, we've been told since 2008, or I guess since the Genesis block in, in January 2009, that you need to have a token in order to prevent spam, and you, even, even Stellar and, and Ripple do the same thing, you need to have a token to prevent spam. If it costs you nothing to use a network, people just, it doesn't cost them anything to abuse a network. So, uh, I, I would draw me to Hyperledger, and again, I'm not saying that it will be you know, grandiosely successful and I'll be... You know, lounging on my yacht next year or anything like that, but well, maybe I will. Um, they uh, they figured a way to actually come up with consensus, and the way they did that is uh, using SSL certificates. Um, basically, in order to become a node on the network, you have to get a CA to issue with SSL. Obviously, that's not completely decentralized, and you do dox yourself that way. But it's kind of a I don't want to say lesser of all evils, but it's it's a, a a way that we actually know exists that can help prevent uh, civil attacks. Have you ever uh, heard of Twister? The, the, IM, the IM client stuff? Yeah, sort of like a Twitter where the miners get incentivized with advertising space. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of it. I, I wrote about it in like chapter six in one of those books. Uh, and, I mean, uh, it hasn't really taken... Have you guys ever used BitMessage? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's slow, and it's not really productive. Like, I use Slack for my... If you've ever used Slack, you want to use Slack? Yeah, okay, see, these are some pro developers back there. Uh, if you want to have a workflow, yeah, get Slack. Uh, yeah, you don't want to have to spend five minutes or ten minutes to wait for your next message on what you should do for code. So, yeah, I mean, it might be useful if you're behind the Great Wall, like, uh, I'm sorry, behind the Great Firewall or something like you know. There's a lot of talk about, you know, utilizing that to create, like, a centralized Facebook or anything. The idea is that the miners are doing something, they're getting incentivized, uh, not something that's, like, money, you know, exactly. And, I just want to know what your opinion would be on like other centralized networks that weren't, you know, you know, where miners aren't actually supplying you a payment network. They're not supplying you a smart contract system, but they're supplying, you know, like social networks or other services. You see, there's a big, big future there. You, you might be able to do it in a decentralized way through uh, proof of stake. But if you're trying to do it through proof of work, you're going to have to incentivize miners. Like the whole purpose of proof of work. And again, I'm not anti proof of work or anti hash. We're incentivized with advertising. Well, you can do that, but then you're going to just, I mean, how are you going to target users so you get some really good, you know, uh, click-through rate and stuff like that? I mean, talk to Brian. He did stuff like that. I can intro you to Any other questions? I'm not trying to be mean, by the way. Like, I, it's, the economics of it are just the thing that might hold it back. Anything else? Okay. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you guys so much all for showing up. Uh, thank you very much again to Dr. Lee and to Tim for speaking. Uh